Loud and clear. All right, well, uh, in that manner, let's be loud and clear. We're going to start this song off with This is a Day here at West Valley Center for Spiritual Living. Reverend Karen's back. She's um, feeling good. She's feeling good, looking good. And so. How are you guys doing? How, by yeah, the way? how are you guys doing out there? How's how your you summer going? going? Are you staying cool? <laughs> So uh, bring it on up. We're going to start this song with This is the Day. Please rise and join in and help us celebrate the day. This is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. Sing that with me. This is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. This is a day, a day to be seized, yeah. A day I can feel my spirit set free. Yes, this is a day, it's time to fly higher and high up in the sky. That's getting longer and longer, Rod. <laughs> remember what you we're coming to. For, I, I was waiting for you. <laughs> yeah. So, like, remember what we're coming to service for. <laughs> um, all right. Welcome to West Valley Center for Spiritual Loving. My name is Reverend Clyde Goins, the assistant minister here. I want to welcome you here on this hot Sunday uh, morning. So, I'm hoping you guys are. At least you're sitting here in the cool, nice, cool air. So we got a great air conditioner in this building now. I'll say that. So yes. Yes, yes. So wonderful. Um, yes, yeah, so we have a lot of fun things going on. Probably um, one of one of the most important things is um, Reverend, Cla Reverend um, Karen's class starts on Thursday, this thing called You. Um, we've got some good sign-up people. People have signed up, and it's um, more people would be great to sign up. This is a great class, and, and uh, Reverend Karen is ready to to, to get back into tr uh, teaching, and so um, we're looking for more people to sign up. You can sign up and show up that for that same day as well. So all is welcome. Um, it is Thursday from 1.30 to 3.30, uh, uh, start, and starting this Thursday. And then re reminder that next uh, week is our um, fundraiser for Survivor, and we're selling tickets. If you haven't noticed, some of the decorations are starting to go up. So um, Kay Fontana will be available after service in the bookstore to sell the tickets. So if you want to purchase a book, uh, a ticket at the, um, t after service, you can purchase a ticket after service. Also, a reminder, it's a um, gourmet for God. I'm not gourmet for God. It's a dude dining with the dude today. So um, <clears throat> we have a really weird menu, but it's still a good food. So um, <laughs> just I'll just say come over and be surprised. Um, and then the one last thing, that one last announcement that we have is that, um, so we sent out the, the, the uh, mid-year um, statements. So um, please um, take a couple minutes to review those mid-year statements. Make sure that, that we have the collection set up correctly, that you've, um, you've contributed, and we thank you very much for your support for that. Uh, but we want to make sure that we have everything that recorded correctly for you. So um, I think that's all the announcements. So um, let's say our vision statement together. So we are a loving, joy-filled community honoring the many paths of God's 
as we learn and live the science of mind principles. And so it is. So just sit back. Feel that nice, cool breeze. Open up your hearts and minds for the Bradford's beautiful music and Reverend Karen's wonderful message. Thank you. So take a deep breath and just be as we go within. I will make a quiet place, a quiet place within my heart, and I will wait upon the Lord. Wait upon the Lord. Be still, my soul, be still. Be still, my soul, be still. Be still and Within my mind, and I will wait upon the Lord. Wait upon the Lord. Be still, my soul, be still. Be still, my soul, be still. Be still and know. place within my life, and I will wait upon the Lord, wait upon the Lord, I will make a quiet place. As we go within, into that quiet place within our mind, we breathe in acknowledging that God is the divine infinite beauty and intelligence that expresses and lives its being in, as, and through each and every one of us. Right here and now, we call upon God's presence to express itself divinely through the Bradfords, through Reverend Karen's talk today, as we acknowledge and go within and with one in that divine expression, hearing, understanding, and embodying what is shared here today, the compassion and the love and the principles that we believe in. We are one with that belief, and we grow and change, knowing that we are still our holy self in all aspects within. And we release and let go of that ego self, you know, that special self, and we acknowledge the holy self that is expressing through us at all times. And we are grateful for this knowingness that God is all there is and that 
our beliefs are expressed upon us as we grow and unfold each and every day. So with this knowingness, with gratitude in every aspect of my life, I release my word into universal law, allowing it to be so, and together we say, so it is. Thank you. So you know me, always taking a reading out of the Science of Mind text, ready to share with you. Um, page 201 of the text, let no fear come into your thought. The first thing a practitioner does is to separate the belief from the believer. It is a personal, not a cosmic problem. Evil does not, evil is not a problem to God. It's only a problem to the individual. <clears throat> Therefore, we separate the belief from the believer and begin to perceive the individuals as a spiritual being, no longer a subject to this belief, and even now the embodiment of perfection. If the practitioner is able to see only perfection, pre perfection, wholeness, he will see health manifested in his patient or her patient. The prac then recognizing that mind or intelligence or spirit, whatever it chooses to call it, <clears throat> is the groundwork for all movement, definitely, specifically, and consciously, speaks his word to the creative medium. To begin to use this principle into the matter how slight you feel your knowledge and your result will impress you to perceive new ways and new methods of approach until you gradually grow deeper into assurance. Thank you. Let us have a fabulous service. So Reverend Karen's talk today is on being a believer and what that means to you. And for me, I think this song really describes what I believe. I believe for every drop of rain that falls, a flower grows. I believe that somewhere in the darkest night, a candle glows. I believe for everyone who goes astray, someone will come to show above a storm the smallest prayer will still be heard I believe that someone in the great somewhere hears every word every time I hear a newborn baby cry or touch a leaf Oh, see the sky, then I know why I
ball. Oh, <laughs> I was waiting for you to surprise me. You did. <laughs> Come on up here. I wanted it to be a little more spontaneous, but this will work. <laughs> because I got real confused. Not, ha not hard to do. All right. So, Survivor's coming up on Saturday, right? Yeah. So, I don't know if you remember, but how this all got started, Karen was talking, Reverend Karen was talking about being interested in being a participant in the Survivor. And she submitted a tape as an audition tape. And I said, I would pay big money people to see that tape. <laughs> and do you want to know? I confiscated the tape, I digitized it, and we have it for display on Saturday night. I haven't, I haven't watched it all, but I did watch a little, and I'm telling you, it's worth the price of admission just to be able to see the tape and to see her blush. <laughs> I don't but do, do join, and I'll tell you, there'll be fun, there'll be food, there'll be games, and oh, gee, I think there's something else. Oh, I do, I think there was something else. What could it be? <laughs> Survivor always takes place where there's danger. <laughs> so, beware. Fun. <laughs> game. And game. It's got, thank you. So please join us, everybody. Thank you very much, Sue. Not so happy about the audition tape, but... What a minister won't do for a uh, little extra income, you know? Mm -mm -mm. Um, so good morning, and welcome to the West Valley Center for Spiritual Living. And oh my goodness, we are really revved up for the, um, for the party next week. It's a, a summertime fundraiser, a way you can help support us through the leaner months of the summer and when people travel and move about. And we have created something so fun. I want to tell you everything is, oh, wait a minute, I wrote it out. Everything is um, West Valley Center for Spiritual Living. The, the, the WVCSL Fitness Council has approved of all the games. <laughs> so they are safe and age appropriate for a congregation that sits on the edge of Sun City and um, with various zip codes that uh, indicate similar attendance. And um, I have had such a fun time creating uh, games that duplicate what they actually do on the show only to make them appropriate for us. And so there will be some where you will need your brain skills. There are some physical challenges that are only lightly physical. Nobody has to play anything, but if you are a people watcher, I think this is an event you won't want to miss because it'll be a hoot to watch everybody um, um, doing the best they can to play all these games. Fun food, oh my gosh, the food committee has gone a little crazy and trying to have something appealing to everybody, but it's going to have a little, a little flair. You know there's going to be a, a theme, a theme. The food won't be rich and spicy, don't worry. <laughs> um, but, well, some of it might, because Juliana's preparing some things. There, there may be an eating competition for anybody brave enough to play, but it won't be with crickets, though I do have crickets I mail ordered. So if you want to try a cricket, you can get a, you get a little fire boost necklace, and the, most, the person with the most fire boost necklaces at the end of the night wins the grand prize, and we have a perfect, wonderful grand prize for you. There'll be a little... A, a little mini, oh, uh, maybe we'll forget about it. Maybe we'll have so much fun playing the games that we won't do the video. But, um, they, it's, I think it's five, five to eight. I think we're looking at five to eight, roughly. And we are going to do a little mini um, um, silent auction. We're going to do it much simpler than we usually do. But we're just looking for us to have a good, fun reason to get together and play and um and you can all laugh at your minister. <laughs> not, not, again, not thrilled about that part, but. The title of my message this morning is that I'm a believer. Way back then, I was a believer that I would actually get chosen to be on that show, and it, you know, the funny part is I don't camp, but um, I, 
But I do have an opinion that it is the best psychological experiment in all of reality TV because what would you do if you were separated from everybody that loved you and, um, and you have to like just make do with what's, what you find on the island and, and what few things are given you. You're hungry and you're competing for a million dollars, you know? So I often wonder, you look at them and you get, if somebody like lies or does something naughty, I always have such a harsh judgment. But then I wonder, what would you do in that environment? So I'm a believer that there are ways we can learn and grow from every element of life. And I thought that was a, something I was really going to have an experience. If I really do, I was completely convinced. And of course, the story ends that Shortly after I submitted my audition tape, I realized, oh, it's not a call to be on TV. It's a call to be a minister. <laughs> I have more work to do. It's going to be a little more complicated than making an audition tape. So I'm talking today about believability, and it's a rather universal topic because we're all believers. You know, the title of the talk is, I'm a believer, and um, the question is, you know, what do you believe? Because we're all believers. We all live in a world that is, uh, that we are always constantly creating, and um, it, when we were little, we used to play, I, don't, I wonder if they still say this, we used to play make-believe, we used to say make-believe, and so all the girls want to play house, and all the boys want to play war, and, um, and cars, and make forts in the, and, and bridges in the dirt and stuff. But we were making, we were using our imaginations to make believe. And what I think is that life is all about us making believe all the time. We just kind of forget that uh, we're, we're participating in what we believe. And so you, you come then to uh, spiritual philosophies and teachings that remind us that where our thoughts are really powerful, n hardly nobody would argue that our words and our thoughts are powerful, that they, they direct us in certain directions and they influence the decisions we make. Nobody really would argue about any of that because we have so much um, um, evidence of it now, you know, the scientific, the, the studies on brain plasticity and all of those exciting things come together to show us that believability is something worth talking about. Dr. Ernest Holmes in the book, How to Change Your Life, isn't that a great title for a book, How to Change Your Life, um, said this, we avail ourselves of the creative action of mind, capital M, mind, the mind of God he's talking about. We avail ourselves to that creative action through what we believe. So we, every week, talk about that on Sunday mornings and in every class we teach and in every magazine article you might pick up on the science of mind. There's always that reminder to go back and examine what it is that you actually believe. Before I... Um, uh, I used to be really religious, and I loved being religious, and I loved, you know, I miss going to church. It was kind of nice to just go to church. <laughs> um, um, now I have to work to go, you know, I have to work to go to church. Um, but I love that, that all, I've always loved the spiritual side of life. And so it was easy for me to, after I was really filled up and overflowing with religious ideas, I made a break and moved into more spiritual way of living my life. And so even as, even as a religious woman, I will say this, I often um, was drawn to the uh, sort of the self-help and the personal growth kind of books that became trendy in the 80s and the 90s. And, um, and I was in heaven. I, you know, I, oh my gosh, I love that. We have so much information now. Um, but even then, even as a religious woman, I was really most drawn to quotes like um, uh, Henry Ford who said, um, whether you think you can or you think you can't, you're right. Um, or there was, there's this wonderful Shakespeare quote from the play Hamlet where Shakespeare said, um, there's nothing either good nor bad, but thinking makes it so. There's nothing either good nor bad, but thinking is what makes it, what points it in one direction or another, and that's why we have different opinions, because we all think different things, and 
we all are free to have uh, whatever beliefs we desire to hang on to. So from scientists and inventors to great literary greats, we, ha we see that there's something common that comes from the, the deep thinking consciousness that tells us that our thoughts and our words matter. Whether or not those are silent thoughts or not, it doesn't matter. They still are powerfully influencing our life. So um, I, I love that I have a, an actual a faith that, that supports this, this way that we can consciously participate in, um, in renewing our lives day by day and becoming more and more conscious and, and just realizing how empowering it is to, to choose and select the, the direction of our thinking and all of that. Um, but it's also challenging. It's also challenging because we not only think about all sorts of things, but we can have, we bump into our own self-doubt. We worry about stuff that we have no control over. And, um, and so that, that keeps us from just always having these wonderful, beautiful thoughts and beliefs on, of goodness. We start wondering if there's something else we should be worried about. We start listening to all the people who have the glass half empty and wondering, should we, is there something we need to prepare for? You know, Is there something I need to be, am I being too naive? And we question. I think questioning is really valuable. I, I would love to think that we all continue to question for, for all of our lives. But another problem that we bump into in living as a human being on this planet is that um, we're living in a world <laughs> where we can hear each other grumble. <laughs> And I don't just mean the tisks and the heavy sighs and the, the way sometimes just being with a, a, a total stranger, you can tell how seriously they're taking life, in, at least in that moment. But I'm talking about the way um, people have... A, um, um, th I'm talking about the way that... Um, the way that we live in this world... And we can intuit from an energetic level somebody else's discontent, right? So it's, it's not even verbal or um, discernible in an obvious way. But that's what the metaphysicians used to call race consciousness. That's the thinking that goes on in the world around us and all the things that get, just get jumbled up together of everything anybody's ever worried about from the beginning of time and even into the future. Um, the way that we, s it's like we bump into that stuff. And I felt like, I was thinking it's like eavesdropping. It's like you're eavesdropping on conversations that really aren't even yours, right? That's what happens when you're watching the news, you know? We're sort of eavesdropping. And I, I don't know about you, but when I'm in my office and somebody comes in to talk to Kay, not to me, it's really hard not to listen even when it's none of my business. If my door is open, it's really hard not to listen. And so sometimes I actually get up and close my door right? Because it just feels more polite if it seems like it's, if it doesn't pertain to me, then, uh, you know, then I, so it's hard not to, and I think we have sort of that, we're like a sponge sometimes, we pick up all that energy that we might not necessarily uh, want. And then um, to make it even more complicated, we then will have judgments about certain things, you know, it's like when you're, when you're in public and somebody's being rude to the checker, it's easy to have, what's wrong with that person? And we go into judgment, because we just want everybody to be happy, right? We don't want to be bumping into all that negativity, but we forget that we're at choice as to what we do with what we bump into. And that's where all our, we can really uh, regain our power and our sense of balance in life. So uh, although it's tempting to blame everything wrong in the world on all the negative Nellies, um, it's not their fault. You know, it's up to us to choose where we want to stand in the middle of all the stuff that's, that's going on in the world. Now, at some point, nearly all of us, I would really like to say all, but you know, um, but I believe nearly all of us wake up to some sort of sense of um, I want to be 
I want to I want to do no harm. I want to I want to get prayed up this morning and I want to leave the house and I want to say kind words. Don't you love that the the Dalai Lama is known to have said um, my religion is kindness. I love that. I love that. It puts it puts spirituality in a in a secular setting so we can hear it. You don't have to be religious to uh, to be kind. And um, I, I like all of that do no harm kind of kind of thinking. My problem, uh, I'm, I'm assuming it's not your problem, but I'll share mine with you in case it's a good illustration. My problem is then if I feel I have been unkind at the end of the day, then I'm hard on myself. And now I go backwards. Now I'm going to be unkind to me without thinking about it. So be careful, be sensitive that you focus on self-compassion, to have compassion for yourself. Because you know what? When we're not happy with ourself is when we're mean to other people. You know, when things are going well, it's easy to show up and be a, a positive thinker and to be kind to everybody. Um, but there are challenges in life that cause us to... Um, I, I believe it's that we are called to have a firmer sense of self-compassion, to be kinder to ourselves, because when I'm kinder to me, I'm kinder to you. I'm kinder to everybody. I don't think it's an accident. I like to say this every so often. I do not think it's an accident that Buddhism and that sense of um, compassion is the big gift of Buddhism, um, that, that Buddhism brought compassion 800 years before Christianity. So do you know what I, that makes me think is that we were not ready for the Jesus message yet. Humanity was not ready to understand that love God with all your heart and love your neighbor as yourself. We were not ready to understand forgiveness and acceptance because first we have to embody the idea of being compassionate. And compassion starts with self-compassion. So we learn it, we practice it, we try it on, we, um, we have foibles and we get to get start again fresh I the next day or the next moment as soon as we decide to try. Now, as you can imagine, when I chose the name of this talk, I'm, I'm looking at that quote and Holmes is talking about us being a believers. I immediately heard the monkey song in my head, <laughs> right? Well, I'm sure all, I mean, come on, that's the whole point, right? Kay thought she was all clever. She printed me the lyrics. I said, I already have them. <laughs> <laughs> I actually printed them last fall when I wrote the talk titles and I got to this one. I went, oh, this will be a really fun talk to give. Please don't sing. Please don't sing. <laughs> but you know I probably will. Um, so the, uh, that song is The Monkeys. Kay was telling me there's only one living monkey that they've all made their transition. They sang their little hearts out. God bless them. So Mickey Dolenz and Mike Green and whoever, you name one more somebody. Mike Nesmith and Davy Jones. Jones. Did I not even think of Davy? And who? Oh, I made up Mike Green. I did not mean Mike Green. Um, okay, all of those. Is he the li is Peter the living one? No. Mickey. Mickey. Oh, isn't that cute? Um, so the song goes, um, I thought love was only true in fairy tales. Now I want you to think about this. I don't know why I'm pointing at you, Kathy. <laughs> Every love song is about God. See, we wouldn't have love songs if there wasn't something in relationship that woke us up to be drawn to, to a beautiful love song. So think of, think of I, I look for a, a God message in every love song. He says, I thought love was only true in fairy tales and then for someone else but not for me, but love was out to get me. Mm -mm -mm. So that's the way it seemed. <laughs> do, 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 do. Disappointment, heartache, all my, all my dreams. Then, then I saw her face. Now I'm a believer. <laughs> and that's, that's right there. Good, see, you do like to sing with me. You're no help at all. You always make me sing. Um, yeah, I'm a believer, and you know, and I was ready to doubt, but then I saw her face. We have to see 
the face, because it's the face of love. <laughs> Therefore, it's the face of God. So we, we put a face on love with another person, and now we have an opportunity to have a more intimate experience of love with the divine, because love doesn't happen on this planet if we don't become a vessel to allow it to express through us. So then I saw her face, now I'm a believer. We, we gotta see the face of God. We got to see the face of God in another human being. And, and that really is the whole point of our living. I love it when that happens to me when I'm in public and it's a total stranger that I know nothing about. And something happens that, you know, you just kind of do a double take and you look back again and it's like that person is glowing. There's something that has shifted in your perception that allows us to see beyond the human form. So we start by looking for the face of God in each other. Remember, there's that gorgeous quote. I use it all the time. Dr. Holmes said something like, um, um, if, we, if, we would, if we would experience love, we must look long and deeply into each other. If we want an experience of love, that's why we're here. That's what relationships are for. That's why relationships are bumpy. So we can get over through the hard stuff and smooth off some of the crusty edges that we never needed to begin with, but we didn't know till we start trusting um, a, another individual. And, and life gives us these opportunities again and again. I'm not talking about your soulmate. Everyone in your life is in relationship with you, including people here in our spiritual community. So I think that work of, of looking for the face of God in each other is really vital. But I believe it's getting us ready for something even more important. And that is... The day you catch yourself looking in the mirror and you get the tiniest glimpse of God looking back at you. If you haven't had that experience, my guess is you don't look directly into your own eyes in the mirror. And that if you will give yourself that gift, Again and again, I promise you will have a moment when you least expect it, and you will see something in you that will guarantee your divinity. You will not be able to deny it. I want you to try that this week. And you can't force it. You can't force it to happen. Just keep trying. Just keep looking at yourself with love and kindness and gentleness and see if you don't have a moment where you catch God glimpsing you. Believability is ultimately up to us. It's very personal. It's very individual. Um, our belief, however, is always measured. The, me the measurement begins with what we believe about ourselves. And you can't dodge your beliefs. You know, Ralph Waldo Emerson said, who you are speaks so loudly, I can't hear your words. So think about these things. You know, when I'm out of sorts, who I am speaks real loud. <laughs> There's no question. Um, when I'm out of sorts, um, it's harder to respond kindly in, in situations that, that life might throw at us. I used to, for many years, I worked for a, a nonprofit organization and I was in charge of the family communication skills program where families came and they, so they were teenagers, uh, I think they had to be 10 years old and older to come. Most of them were court ordered. I also worked with parolees teaching um, child abuse prevention skills 
And um, that was a court-mandated program that helped people be reunited with their children. And it was a real tough class, tough group of people to work with. But we had this one story that we always told every few months, because you get new people rotating through all the time. Every few months we told this story, and it's an, it's an old story. It's, it's kind of oversimplified, but it makes such a strong point. If you're in a foul mood, that ripples out. And here's, here's the illustration we would give. So there's a nice little house. I, I don't know why I think of like um, Donna Reed or, you know, leave it to Beaver. <laughs> Dad's coming home from work. There's two kids, a boy and a girl. Mom's in the kitchen with their apron, making dinner. And, <laughs> and pearls, yes, and a strand of pearls. <laughs> and Dad comes in the front door, and immediately everybody knows he's in a foul mood. Hey! When's dinner? Mom's in the kitchen. She's like, whoa, he's in a bad mood. What the heck happened? So she looks over at the daughter who's sitting at the table doing her homework, and she says, Sally, get the table set. Clear the table and get the table set, quickly. And Sally goes, man, what did I do? Why is she mad at me? I didn't do nothing. Little brother's on the floor playing with his cars on the kitchen floor, and then Sally gets up and she goes, get out of the way, stupid. And the little boy's like, well, I didn't do anything. And he gets his cars, and he gathers his stuff up, and he goes to leave the kitchen, and he sees the dog, so he bunts the dog. <laughs> and the dog goes, well, I didn't do anything. What's wrong with everybody? And the dog sees the cat, and he takes off and chases the cat under the bed. The next night, Dad comes home in a bad mood again. Boom, boom, boom. Everything happens. Everybody yells at everybody else just like the first night. By the third night, dad comes in the house, slams the door, and the cat runs under the bed. <laughs> Do we know this story? Yes. Yes. It's not that unusual. I mean, it's a little exaggerated and oversimplified, but it, it's still, we understand the chain of events. We understand the way the ripple things uh, happens, the way it all unfolds. There's a, a great uh, phrase that I always think of that I learned from uh, A Course in Miracles. And there's this theory in A Course in Miracles that always, always we are um, expressing love. And if we're not expressing love, because by the nature of being human, we're designed to express love. If we're not expressing love, then when we get a little feisty, our, 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 our meanness, our mean-spiritedness is a call for love. And so there's this basic sort of principle. It starts with, well, it's either love or fear. Where are you? And I have this uh, in my mind. One time years ago, I was facilitating a class, and uh, based on that quote, that you're, you're either um, it, it showing your love, expressing it in the world, embodying it, receiving it, or you're, you're sort of in angst and you're, you're fighting it. And that, that so somebody said in one of my spiritual circles, somebody said, you know the way I see that? It's like this. Um, a, a child that needs a nap, think of a toddler. So there's a point when a kid gets overtired. We do it too, but it's more fun to just give the children as an example. We can pick on kids. Um, <laughs> Um, and let's say it's, it, you know, you're away from home because that's where you see the, the unhappy children or, you know, where they've missed a nap and they're out in public or they don't feel good. And, um, th and the kid might start whining and then pretty soon uh, mom's got her hands full and everybody else is hoping she'll just leave the store with the crying baby. Um, but there comes a point where a mother that is paying attention realizes it's, it's not going to do any good to yell at the kid, right? So we have an unhappy toddler. Now we've got mom, especially if you're in public, it can be embarrassing. Now if mom starts yelling at the kid, you know what's going to happen with the child, right? So somebody's telling this story in the class I'm teaching, and this man says, oh, it's like the mom who's paying attention would pick up the baby and hold the baby, or, you know, you go home, or it, maybe you're busy at home, you know, cr trying to make dinner sometimes with a crying baby is hard. So she'll sit down, 
and she'll wrap her arms around the baby and she'll, she'll sort of rock the baby or maybe sit in the rocking chair a little while and just give the baby a, a few minutes of undivided attention and very often they'll go to sleep. Now they'll resist. They don't want to go to sleep. You know how that is. You get overtired and it's harder. But, um, but the loving arms holding and comforting the, the unhappy child can bring the rest that the child needs. And so I have, because it was such a moment in that class, I have embodied that idea when I'm feeling feisty, what if we aren't just like uh, an uncomfortable baby and all we really want to do is be comforted in the arms of something greater than we are? And so I create an image in my own mind, and sometimes I sit in my comfort chair, and I imagine that, that, a, a, that a God of my imagination could put arms around me and hold me and rock me and comfort me until I can calm myself down and feel better again. And it's an amazing image if, you, if that works for you. I know not everybody has that concept of, of, a, of a God that has that uh, human-like ability to comfort us. But take what you can and use that. Apply it in your very own um, experience of living. In the book of Psalms, in the eighth chapter, King David said, we are crowned with glory and honor and endowed with dominion over things. So this is not the same, you, we have dominion over things as like in the book of Genesis with the story of creation. We don't, it's not about having dominion over the land and over the animals and, and all of that. This is, I believe, we could interpret this in such a way we could use it for everything. You are endowed with dominion over all things. Do you know what I think David was saying there? He's telling us that we are mightier than any circumstance we might encounter. He's reminding us we're not just human, but we're divine, that there's something really heavenly about us. There's a perfection that desires to be revealed in this sense of wholeness in a higher way. And the thing we know is that the divine in us always transcends the human. The divine always transcends the human. And that's because we're bigger than our littleness. We're stronger than any sense of brokenness or weakness. And we have power and dominion over all our experiences. That's because we, we are powerful in the way that we can use our attitude and deal with whatever circumstance is before us. See, there's, there's a truth about you, but without believability, you won't be able to see it. That's why we come back on Sunday to remember again. Here's something interesting I came across. Phineas Parkhurst Quimby um, was, uh, is considered sometimes the father or the grandfather of new thought. Sometimes we refer to him as the, uh, one of the original mental healers that started bringing structure to healing spiritualities. And um, Quimby was born in... Um, 1802, almost 100 years before Dr. Ernest Holmes, and Quimby said this, Our belief cannot alter a scientific truth, but a belief can alter our feelings for happiness or for misery. Disease is the misery of some belief. Disease, hear that as dis ease in your body, not just illness, dis-ease, discomfort in your body in any way. Disease is misery of some belief that you have within you or you wouldn't be feeling it, experiencing it. Happiness, however, is the health of our wisdom. And then he concludes by saying this, a sour misery comes from our belief 
not from the thing that we believe in. Think about that. The sour misery, the distasteful um, experience of feeling whatever it is you're going through comes from whatever you're believing about it, not from whatever you think it is. So we think if we just get rid of this negative person in our life, or we think if we just fix that one thing at home that's driving us crazy because it's a little out of kilter, we think if we can uh, fix a, a relationship in a way that we think we want it to be, we think everything will be fine, and it's, it's never the thing. It's whatever our belief is that is fueling that discomfort. So then he ends by saying, so be on the watch. Be on the watch. Belief is not a fact, but whew, it is powerful, and we know this to be true. So let's decide to be believers in good, in possibilities, in positive outcomes, in the ways in which we can make new decisions and redirect our lives. And don't forget, keep looking and expecting to see the face of God. That's what I wanted to say today. So just take a nice, deep, cleansing breath right where you are. Just notice that all the energy in your body is shifting and moving and settling in the same way that the powerful words spoken in this room today, the beautiful music that has been sung, the words that have been prayed, we just feel this sense of sacredness everywhere. And we feel the love of God within us. So I feel that love and the power of it it is the movement of life. It is the activity of spirit right here, right now. Because we know the, the words spoken in the form of prayer are, are magnificently active. We open ourselves to the grace of God in this very moment so that we might be physically uh, revitalized that we might be healed from anything that has seemed to, to ail us, that we might quit resisting whatever beliefs have been hidden from our awareness, and we might step into a place of releasing any dis-ease in our beings and in our lives. I feel the love of God, and I know that it is a, a, a divine light. It is an illumination that is electrical and that it has this activity that is ongoing that it is continually given from spirit itself and therefore there are, are times in each day where we recognize there's something more going on that the, the divine in us transcends the humanity and that we are lifted that together we rise in consciousness in such a way that we become a healing force on this planet. So wherever there is an experience of, of, of a relationship that may be strained, we just open ourselves and see that here too is a call for love. We open ourselves to the flow of that love for God's love is the greatest force in this universe. And we know that, that there is something perfected. There is that which is already perfect that is revealing itself in all of our experiences here in this community, in the success of our upcoming event, in the beauty in our sanctuary that we experience every Sunday 
and in the blessed space of our homes as we listen remotely. I feel the love of God and I just feel such gratitude that we are reawakened, that we are, are rediscovering the truth of our being and that we dare to look in the mirror and to look in our eyes and to recognize that it is God that is looking back at us. So I say thank you, God. Thank you, Infinite Spirit, for the blessings that we have received and for those that are yet to come. How grateful I am. And I simply release the words of this prayer into that law that always responds affirmatively. Together we let it be, and so it is. Amen. Thank you, Bradford. So um, I was when, when Reverend Karen was talking about that story about the Leave It the Beaver family storyline. I remember Mom being upset, <laughs> not Dad. <laughs> and, Ma, and Dad went to the bedroom. <laughs> Anyways, all right. So now's the time to celebrate the abundance of our lives, the abundance of our our community, um, we're reminding everybody that we don't pass the offering plate because we know that, that we are fully supported and we appreciate all of your um, donations and your tithes. We have drop boxes in the back. We have drop boxes on the way to um, um, Dining with the Dudes and we have drop boxes in the bookstore and we also, you can contribute online. So we appreciate everything that you do to support our community. So let's say our giving affirmation together. And a consciousness of good, divine love, blesses and multiplies all that I am, all that I have, all that I give, and all that I receive. Thank you, God. And so it is. Please rise for our last song.
should be alive. It feels good to be alive, and I just have to say it one more time. Please come next Saturday. It's going to be a lot of fun. We're going to have a lot of fun playing fun games. All right, so let's say our closing affirmation together. Repeat after me. I believe I am loved, supported, and guided. And I express life through compassion. And so it is.